Endurance is an endearing quality in humanity. Being able to go further than others is the concept of courage. That's what courage is. That you're able to step forward when others may stay where they are or even step back. And when we look at the life of the Prophet Wasallam, we see that from a very young age, he was the kind of person who stepped forward. And he was the type of person who not just stepped forward for his own personal gain, but step forward for the gain of himself, his family, his society, and his people. And I hope inshallah, you know, God willing, in the next 30 minutes as we discuss the trials and the tribulations and the struggle of the Prophet wasallam, that it resonates with you and I with some of the difficulties that we endure in life. And the aim of my discussion is not just simply to give you some historical account or, you know, uh, pull at your spir spiritual uh, 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 rings in your heart, strings of your heart. But it's rather it, my aim and my, my hope, inshallah, that it is something that you can use and extract from it life lessons to further your life to that which is better and that which is more accommodating and, 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 and enter into a state of salvation for yourself here and into the future. Allahumma ameen. The Qur'an addresses humanity in a variety of ways. And one of the things that the Qur'an seeks to do is to make the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and all of those who preceded him. Now for us as Muslims, you know, we're, we're under no illusion that Muhammad Sallallahu is just one of the bricks of prophethood. And there's this beautiful statement where he says, I'm that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if you were to walk into an area and saw this wonderful mansion, you saw this beautiful castle, and you said, wow, this castle is stunning. If only that final brick could be put in place. You know, that the, the, the whole building's complete, but there's just that one little brick that if it was put there, the building would be un, unblemished, perfect. I'm that brick, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he saw himself and informs us that he was a conti, con, continuance of all of the messages that preceded him. And the Quran comes not telling the story of the Prophet, but rather tells us the stories of the prophets who preceded him. So there's more mention of the name Moses than Muhammad in the Quran. There's more mention of the name Isa, Jesus, in, than Muhammad in the Quran. There's more mention of Abraham and Dawood and Sulaiman, you know, David, Solomon, Ibrahim alayhim salam than there is the mention of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the aim behind that is Allah says, وَلَقَدْ صَرَّفْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ Allah says, it has been put in this Qur'an an example, a parable, a similitude for humanity in every cause in their life that they can find something that they can take a parable from it. And it, you know, if I would just to just give you a pause for a second. If you were to look in the Qur'an, you want to talk about families. You know, families are important and endearing to us. You can see the different social structures of families in the Qur'an, in the stories of the Prophet. If you want to, you know, if you want to study the life of a father and son who work together upon truth, you can look at Abraham and his son Ishaq, or Abraham and his son Ismail. If you want to see an awesome father and a terrible son, you can look at the example of Noah and his son. If you want to see the example of an amazing son and a terrible father, you can look at the example of Ibrahim and his father Azar. If you want to see the example of brothers who are jealous of their youngest sibling, you can look at Yusuf and his brothers. If you want to see the example of a, a, a kind and generous woman who's put under tyranny of an oppressive husband, you can look at Asiya or Bithiya, the wife of Fir'aun, Pharaoh. If you want to see the example of an orphan child who's mistreated by the father, you look at Moses and Pharaoh. If you want to see the example of you know, brothers who join together in calling to the truth, you can look again at the example of Yusuf and how he brings his brothers back through his compassion and forgiveness to the path of God. 
If you want to look at the example of brothers upon truth, you look at Moses and Harun, Moses and Aaron. If you want to look at a father and son, one who leads the other and the other inherits him, David and Sulaiman. Right? Every example has been given in the Quran. And the aim behind the Quran is that we get in touch with these stories because from their lessons, Ibratan li ulil albab is a lesson for those whose hearts are alive. And Muhammad وسلم, was given these stories and given those narratives so that his heart could become firm upon truth. And every time he saw hardship and difficulty in his life, God would not just say to him, be good, worship me, but God would give him the illusion of that which happened before him. And therefore the first prophet whose story was delivered in its entirety to Muhammad وسلم, was the prophet Moses. You know, he endured so much. He, he went through so many difficulty, so many hardships, that in it were major lessons for the Prophet ﷺ. And when the Prophet endured more difficulty, the life of Yusuf, you know, he was jailed unrightly. He was accused of sin that, he was, that was unjustified, that people knew he was innocent of. And even though that was true, he was put in prison unjustly. Time and time again, whenever Allah spoke to the Prophet about the difficulties that he faced, it was not just about him, but it was an extension of that which had been received in revelation before him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why is there hardship in life? And that question is an important question. You know, why, do, why for, to good people, why do bad things happen to good people? Why are all of us in different ways and in different measures and at different times tested? And you know, there's this statement in the Quran where Allah talks about the prophets of God. He says, Hatta idha stay as a rusul, until the prophets would be driven to breaking point, where it's almost as if they were about to give up. Stay as a rusul, annahum kad kudibu. And to them, creeping into their heart and the heart of their followers was doubt about what they had received in revelation. Ja'ahum nasruna. It's at that point where it's the last straw and it's the last breath and I feel I can't go on, that deliverance would arrive to them. And when you look at the themes, you know, uh, the biblical themes and the Quranic themes of that which has happened to the nations before us, you see this very much true. Why does difficulty strike us? And there's, you know, there's two parts to it. Part of it is self-induced and sometimes we don't want to admit that. You know, sometimes we know the difficulty that arrives in our life, that we are somewhat in cause for it. We acted unjustly with others and therefore we should not, in, we should not be expecting that life will be cream cheese. You know, we say that back home in America and Canada, cream cheese. Before, you know, cheese was always hard. You had to saw it. And then someone invented that delicious, spreadable, creamy stuff. And life was easy. You just spread it. But eventually, you're faced with difficulty and hardship. Every single one of us experiences something different. But the sum of that experience, at times we know that we are root cause to it. And there's, you know, this, this concept within all traditions of humanity that speak of God and speak of, 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 of justice, where they say, do unto others as you want others to, do unto you. And we say as Muslims, uh, You don't really uh, you know, come to true faith until you love for others what you love for yourself, which inversely means that when you have hatred for others, it draws that hatred to yourself. And when you have malice towards others, others' malice is attracted to yourself. And therefore, a lot of it, بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Allah initially says some of the difficulties we endure is what our own hands has reaped and He forgives us much. There's so much that we are forgiven for. And therefore, some of it we take fault. But there's also another element of test and trial and hardship, which is what was experienced by the blessed Prophet and the Prophets of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wa Alayhim Afdalus Salam Peace be upon all of them 
which is not out of any injustice that they have done, but out of the trials of life to bring out liyamiz al khabitha min al tayyib, to bring out the best of your metal. The best of your metal, and this is a concept in Islam called fitna. The word fitna, it means where you take gold that was mixed up with, you know, different elements in the earth and you put it under pressure and in extreme heat and from it you can pour out the true gold. That's called fitna. And life is fitna. Life is intentionally, uh, you know, puts you under stresses to bring out the best of you. And that's what I t- want to talk to you today about, about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of him was seen at the most difficult of times. And I'm going to give you know, a few moments from his seerah or his life biography that I hope can give an allusion to this. You know, from a very young age, our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and all those who preceded him, endured a great deal. He was an orphan as a young child. And being an orphan, that was something that kept, was in his heart, he always thought about it. And one of the earliest chapters in the Quran that was revealed to him is called Al-Duha, the daybreak. It's a chapter all of us memorize, right? What duha by the daybreak. And that illusion of, of light coming out of the darkness is very much about the spiritual existence of a believer that out of the darkness, you can find true faith and light. And Allah says, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى By the breaking light and the passing of that darkness of your life. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord had never forgotten you and had never let you be astray sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى And the next life is always preferred to this life. And we as Muslims always think about what is to come rather than what we are in. And we endure further and further the, the trials and the difficulties in life, knowing that in the future, that there will always be peace and ease. And it's not just about the moment of right now, but what there is tomorrow. And Allah says to him, Alam yatiman fa'awa. Did he not, your Lord, find you an orphan? And he was the one who protected you? And therefore we know from early on that the Prophet you know, felt the difficulty of being alone and that his father had passed away and in the age of five or so, his mother had passed away. And he was one of those who were set aside that the kindness of others was not something that immediately reached him except through his uncles and his family. I want you to look at that moment and then years later, see this moment where a man named Al-Aqra ibn Habis he sees the Prophet cuddling his grandchildren. The Prophet was very expressive with love. You know, he was holding his grandchildren and Hassan and Hussein, and he was kissing them and tickling them and you know, they would ride on his shoulders and even in prayer, they'd jump all over him and so on. And Al-Aqra says to the Prophet, you know, I have 10 kids and I've never connected or played with them in the way that I see you doing now. Like, isn't this kinda, you know, this isn't, isn't that a little bit soft? You know, and sometimes we make that mistake. I, I have three young children and I have Shireen, my wonderful, beautiful daughter. She's eight years old and I have Umar and Adam. And sometimes, you know, we'll be at a park and you'll see one of their friends will fall over, right? And they'll scrape their knee and the father will run over and the boy's crying. He's like four. And the father will say something like, stop crying, hold it in, be a man. And you see this four-year-old just standing there like trying, trying to impress his dad. I'll be a man, okay, I'm not gonna cry. But you know, it's not right. And the Prophet says to this man who's saying something similar, like, you know, I got these kids, but I don't do that kind of, you know, stuff. I want my kids to be hard. I don't want them to be little sissy boys. So the Prophet says to him, what can I do with a man who God has removed mercy from his heart. Like the mercy of God is connected to those simple acts that we perform with young, you know, with with these young people. In another statement, the Prophet said, the one who wants rahmah, compassion, and God's mercy to enter their heart, if they have (coughs) nothing else that they can give forward, just to pat the head of an orphan. 
like just to come to that young child and say, I care enough about you that I will give you some of your attention, some attention. And it's one of those things that, you know, gives you a deep insight into what it was like for the Prophet ﷺ. He felt that pain of that young orphan. There's this amazing story of a companion. And, you know, his name is uh, Abu Dahdah. You know, it's a strange name. Not many of you might have heard this story. But Abu Dahdah was this righteous, righteous soul. He was this beautiful, beautiful man who lived with the Prophet ﷺ. And he owned this amazing garden. Like, if you were to ask anyone in Medina, who has the greatest orchard, greatest palm fields, they would say, Abu Dahdah, that's the one I want to buy. And one day, a young orphan came to the Prophet's masjid, and he came complaining. And the Prophet empathized with this young man because he was an orphan. This young man, his father had recently passed away, and the responsibility of looking after his family fell squarely on his shoulders. Now, in the desert of Arabia, if you didn't sequester your animals well and keep them behind fences and they ran out in the desert they don't come back they die there so this young man he came to his neighbor and said i want to build a fence because now that my father's passed away i can't do too many chores and look after the animals and look after things can i build a fence between my property and your property so that my animals don't go out into the desert and for me to be able to do that you need to sell me this tree that is right on the boundary of our land. Either give it to me or sell it to me. I need to cut it down and build the fence through it. And the man said, no, which is in his right. It's his tree. And after weeks, he would up the price. And the man said, no, I'm not going to do it. Finally, this young child, this young, newly orphaned young man comes to the prophet and says, you know, the world is on my shoulders. I'm looking after my family. I'm at breaking point. And this man, I'm just asking for that one tree. I'm not asking for much. Can you please talk to him on my behalf, O messenger of God? And the prophet invites the man and sits him down and honors him, doesn't humiliate him, and says, will you give it to him out of generosity? He says, no. Will you sell it to him? He says, no. Not after I've been had a complaint come to me about it, to you about it, about me, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You know, arrogance sometimes it pushes you away from the truth. He said, how dare this young boy, this little kid, bring my name to you and humiliate me in this way in front of you. I will never sell it to him. I'm going to teach him a lesson. And the Prophet says to him, if you were to sell him that tree, I would guarantee you a tree in Jannah. Like guarantee, like you have a place in paradise. And that man said, no. You know, sometimes your heart closes, you know, that, that rahmah and that compassion is lost. No, not even for a tree in paradise. And leaves. Abu Dahdah, he is not involved in this, but he's sitting in the masjid and he hears this. And he owns this wonderful garden. Abu Dahdah runs after this man and says to him, I will give you my garden for that one tree. The man says, are you crazy? You give me your whole garden for that one tree? He said, yes. He said, It's an evil tree, this tree that I've, been, that I've had to reject an offer like this from the Prophet. He regretted it, but he was too proud to go back. Abu Dahdah said, the garden is yours. And he went back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I give you this tree to give to that young orphan. Will I still have that tree in Jannah? And the Prophet said, Kam min idqin radahan ya Abu Dahdah. Your tree is so abundant of fruit. You know, that treatment of a young person, that treatment of an orphan, for us as Muslims, it's connected to our love of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, when Allah says to the Prophet in that surah, Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa, didn't he find you an orphan and look after you? At the end of the same chapter, the Prophet is told, fala Therefore, the yatim, that orphan, you yourself, what you experience, don't ever forget that moment. And when you see an opportunity to be helpful, do it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's the aim of our ummah.
As a young child, he grew up wanting, but God always gave him sufficiency. He came with the call of truth. You know, he came to the people and he said, you know, our faith is really simple. You know, Islam is very simple. All, you, all you're asked is to believe in the one true God. That's it. And when he came to his people, and it wasn't something that they didn't want to give or that they don't believe at all in anything. But they did not want to submit to someone who they thought wanted authority. And I say to you now, Islam was never about authority. And a lot of the political violence that you see falsely in the name of Islam is foreign to Islam because of that. It's political violence and not related to the word of God. Even though the words of God are chosen, sadly, to try to justify it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And therefore you see that the Prophet sallallahu his aim in life was to bring people to truth, to the belief in God.